Thank you, Mary Kay. Um, I'm Matt West, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, spoken a couple times before and shared this with a couple people, and I thought a lot about what I was going to say prior to those times, and um, got up there and spoke, and it just it, it never came out the way that I wanted it to. You know, it wasn't uh, as profound, I guess, as I would have liked it, or um, you know, but. Hopefully in each of those cases I did there what I'm trying to do tonight, which is to talk to one person, really, because I'm just one man sharing with other people how I started working this program, how it got me sober, and how I've stayed sober since, really. Um, so with that said, I, I really hadn't thought about much of what I'm going to say. I just... Uh, figure I'm going to get up here and talk, and uh, whatever happens will just be what God wanted me to say. So to, um, let's see, start off, I remember the first time that I, that I came to this room, uh, I was in Bisco, North Carolina, and um, I'd started to go to AA there because a, a boss of mine had caught on to my drinking, you know, while I was teaching other people how to be healthy in the gym and uh, told me I had to go to AA or else I was going to get fired. I didn't want to lose my job so I started to go to AA, make it look good and you know just kind of continue to do what I do on the side and I came over here and I, it was like walking in that door, it, it really did, it felt like being on a completely different planet because you know at the time I didn't know what y'all had, I didn't want what you had didn't really care, I just know I didn't want what I had, you know, and I came in here and I, I had a sponsor, I think I sat there, there, and, you know, the meeting, it was a discussion meeting on a Tuesday night, and it commenced, and um, people were talking, and I had no idea what anybody was talking about, I just knew how bad that I felt in those moments, and um, it was really uncomfortable, because people kept walking up to me, hey man, how you doing? You know, what's going on? Hey, you having a good day? No, I'm not having a good day, but I'm going to tell you I am because I want you to think I am. I want you to think I'm okay. You know? And, you know, that's the way it went up until I surrendered. And at that moment of surrender, and uh, that motion for me was, was going to treatment down in Rockingham. <laughs> So I was born in uh, my sobriety date is August, it's August 8th, no it's August 7th of 2016 and uh, I have a sponsor, I also sponsor other guys now and that really is a blessing because I mean I just didn't think I was going to make it this far, that's the bottom line. And um, so, with that said, I, just a brief background, I, I grew up in a family with a mother and a father and a younger sister. Uh, there wasn't anything unusual about the family. It's a well-educated family. They like to argue a lot, so there's some very sophisticated arguing going on in the house. But, you know, that kind of put a competitive edge in you. You didn't, it wasn't about being right. You had to prove that you were right in certain ways with at least three different references from at least five years back. You know, I mean, it was just, it was all kinds of, it, I remember feeling very defensive early, very defensive that like whatever came out of my mouth or whatever I did, I had to justify it. I had to have reasons for it, you know, just in case somebody came up to argue with me. And then I can tell you exactly why I was doing what I was doing and why you're wrong for saying a damn word to me and embarrassing the shit out of me because I was very easily embarrassed. I was sensitive, I was a real sensitive kid, I was dramatic, extremely dramatic, I mean, you know, that, that grew up as a kid, it was pitching a fit so I can draw as much as attention to maybe I was going to embarrass you and you'd leave me alone, you know, to getting older and getting through adolescence and that got to, um, well, I'm going to win the argument by yelling louder than you and hitting a wall or shoving you or doing something else outlandish because if I did that, I'd win the argument. You don't want to argue anymore. It was not really winning an argument, it was, it was winning a bullying contest, you know? Uh, I wanted to scare you, 
because I didn't want to be wrong. Um, it also served as a way to keep people away from me. I didn't want you to get to know me. You might not like me because I certainly didn't like myself. I uh, walked around. I remember like in fourth and fifth grade down in Spartanburg, uh, you know, comparing myself to people. I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time, and I didn't know that's why I felt less than. But I remember thinking, well, he's got a girlfriend. I don't have a girlfriend. What's wrong with me? You know? Um, from there, I, from Spartanburg, we moved to a little place called Grundy, Virginia. And um, it was a small coal mining town. My dad was a hospital administrator, so, you know, we moved around quite a bit. Um, but moved there, and that was middle school, and I, you know, I hated middle school. It was just a weird time, hitting adolescence, hitting puberty, and, uh, you know, I'm still not the tallest guy in the room, but especially wasn't then, you know. Um, might have had, might have had a little bit of Napoleonic complex going on, you know, short man syndrome. If you're big, I want to challenge you just to prove that I'm worth it. And... Uh, I remember in, in Virginia, that's kind of where I, I started get, taking an interest in sports uh, quite a bit. I wanted to, well, I, I was starting sixth, seventh, eighth grade football, and right out of the gate, I wanted to be an NFL player. You know, it's, I didn't know what it entailed or anything about it, but that, that was my goal. You know, I didn't care about my stature, I didn't care about any fact of reality. I was going to be an NFL player. You know, and my dad was sitting with me in a subway going, I don't know if that's going to be, well, you know, he's just holding me down, man. So, you know, there's always this, this grandiose thinking that I, that I could accomplish more than I could realistically accomplish based off of any, any evidence in my life. Um, at the time, very early on, from Virginia, we moved to Bisco briefly for six months, uh, went to school here, and then we moved down to Mariana, Florida, where I started high school. And by then, I had uh, gotten pretty into weightlifting. Up in Virginia, it was a really good wrestling program, like eight best in the country. So I got to train at a pretty high level and actually see what high-level competitors did in order to be high-level. You know, um, I wasn't the greatest athlete, but then I learned that you know work ethic had a lot to do with it. And so that's what I did. I, I got down to Florida and I hit the gym. School was never hard for me. Um, I never studied. I'd show up, I'd take a test, I'd do well, made A's and B's, and you know, that's kind of how that went. And that never really bit me until later. But, um, so, you know, I, my focus and, and what I woke up in the morning to do was to go lift weights and was to go play sports. And so I, I, I did that, and around that time, that it was the first time I went to the party, the first time I felt the effects of, of alcohol was in eighth grade up in Virginia. I had taken some, my mother had given me some NyQuil. And uh, I was sick as a dog, took the NyQuil, and I sat back in a recliner and I was watching golf. And I don't like golf, but I was sitting there watching golf and I was perfectly content. And everything in the world was okay. To the point where I, you know, I noticed it enough to where I asked my mom, I said, hey, you know, what's, why do I feel great? You know, she said, oh, that's, that's the alcohol content. And I didn't say it out loud, but at the time I thought to myself, well, I've got to get me some more of that. You know, that was it. I mean, because in that moment I felt exactly like I wanted to feel. Like when I looked at other people, like I thought they felt all the time. And I wanted that. You know, I wanted to be okay with me. So I, you know, I... <laughs> I'd go back, you know, it says take every four hours. I'd ask her for it every three, and she wasn't keeping track. But, you know, you build up, I guess, a tolerance to that stuff pretty quick in, in the little amounts. And um, the next time that I really drank was my freshman year in high school when I was 14, and I went to a keg party. And it was the first time that I had, like, untethered access to alcohol. And I did exactly what an alcoholic does and I drank to blackout off of keg beer. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about that night. I, 
I remember thinking everything was okay and then everything was spinning. Can't remember if I threw up. Um, I don't remember liking the taste of beer, but I, I remember it affected me. And so <laughs> you apply some work ethic and just get it down and then you'll get what you want. <laughs> you know, and a um, little later on, I, I think I went to a second keg party in the beginning there. And I woke up from the second keg party and I, I don't know what, what had changed in my thinking. My parents had always told me, and I knew my grandfather was a recovered alcoholic over in Bisco. Um, my parents had always told me, you have it on both sides of your family. And I was kind of listening to him then, you know, at least I was aware of it. And so I thought, okay, I mean, I, I didn't know what it meant to be an alcoholic. I didn't know that it meant I couldn't stop. I just figured, you know, well, if I don't want to be an alcoholic, I'll stop. And after that second keg party, I woke up the next day and decided that I wanted to win a state championship in weightlifting and beer didn't serve any purpose in that. And so I decided not to party anymore. And, um, but that didn't, you know, that, that took those feelings inside of me and it, and it kind of made me have to live with them, you know, deal with them. And that didn't always come out in the best way. I was pretty, I wasn't social. Um, if you tick me off, I'll let you know uh, in the meanest way possible uh, because anytime you came up against me, I didn't, you know, I was, it's all fear-based. You know, I'm certain it was all fear-based because again, you know, confrontation and all this kind of stuff that I'm terrified of, I wanted you to feel this big. I wanted you to walk away feeling that big because it made me feel this big. And that was a high I could ride for a while. And um, just because of the way my family was with their, their education and, and stuff like that, accomplishments were a big part of, you know, success as a person, I guess. And success as a man, it was what you accomplished. So no matter how I acted, I always, you know, made A's and B's. And, and, and at the time, I, I didn't drink. Um, the truth is, about once every six months, I came up here with my cousins, and I, and I would drink with my cousins and then go back down to Florida and tell them that I didn't drink. That was, that's more the truth of like that three year period in my life. But, um, you know, so I'm down in Florida and they don't, they don't know that I, every once in a while I step out and drink. So for argument's sake, I was A's and B student. I don't drink, I don't get into trouble in school. I was an honor student, you know, I'm in the weight room, all this kind of stuff. Anything else that I do should be justified whether I'm mean, nasty, all this other kind of stuff. Look at what I've done. Have you done that? Are you doing that? If you're not, then shut up and mind your own business. Because what can you tell me? And that's how I carried myself, man. I didn't have a lot of friends. I <laughs> can't figure out why. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I isolated. I, I isolated and hid. I hid behind sports and I hid behind accomplishments. Um, I never really dated anybody back in high school. I dated for two weeks and that would go as it would go and I'd get tired of it and I'd, you know, drop them. Didn't give them any reason, just drop them. You know, move on because they weren't serving a purpose to my state championship. <laughs> um, after high school and everything, I, I, I did well in sports and uh, graduated with honors. And then about the same time that I graduated high school, my dad, um, he, he lost his job from, it, it's, it's complicated, but he lost his career. He didn't lose his job, he lost his career as a hospital administrator, a 20 year career. That was like, I mean, this was the, the prize in his life. Uh, if he had nothing else, he had his career. And I remember, uh, I remember seeing him at 18 and this guy that had always kind of told me, listen, it, it, it doesn't matter what other people think, it matters who you are. Maybe this kind of like one good moral compass in my life. I watched people, I, I watched him break. And I watched him uh, sit in a recliner for a year and not get up 
not to get a job, not to get anything. He was broken, and I didn't know what to do. Sports were over with. I knew I was going to do fine in school whether I drank or not, and so I decided it was time to make up for time lost. And I drank, and I drank often. I knew how to get it, and it was like, it was like nothing ever stopped after that keg party, man. I just drank. And my rationale behind it then was, you know, why put effort into anything if people can just rip it out from under you? And, and things that, like, some, some, somebody had worked on for 20 years. I mean, I, I took that and I twisted that. You know, that's my dad. That doesn't have anything to do with me and my life and the outcomes in my life. It matters what I do. But I took what happened to him and I turned it into my excuse as for not giving a damn about anything or anyone again. You know, at first it was the accomplishments I'm doing right now. It's... Look what happened to him. I mean, this is it's my dad. I mean, what? And so that's how I operated there. And I, I went to community college for a couple of years and uh, drank, come to class drunk. But I, and my grades, my grades started to suffer then a little bit. Um, it took me two and a half years to get an associate's degree. Then I went on to the University of North Florida. That first semester at the University of North Florida, I got my first DUI in Tallahassee, Florida, um, after break, after I had failed a semester because I couldn't show up to class. I couldn't show up to class, I couldn't show up to anything responsible, but you bet your ass I was at a party early. And um, that kind of ensued, and, and I didn't realize it at that time, but like later on down the road, that was God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself because it didn't stop me, but it put the brakes on hard to where I couldn't deny that it was causing a serious problem in my life. And so I spent the next little while blaming others for that DUI and, and all this kind of stuff and continued drinking and, and continued not going to class. And I was already on academic suspension. I um, wound up in a mental institution where like five days I had None of, the, none of the medications that the doctor had me on. I had no alcohol, no, uh, I wasn't really smoking a lot of marijuana at the time, but, and then no nicotine, and they locked me in there for like five or six days to where I just had to be with myself. And while during that period, I, I thought to myself, I, I guess, I had a friend come by and, and, and drop off a book. Um, called the Good Shepherd or, so, or something to that nature. And it was about, you know, it was about Jesus and uh, I didn't, didn't want anything to do with that. But I didn't have anything better to do, so I read it, you know? <laughs> and uh, my roommate, Crazy Keith, he liked to talk a lot. But um, I read it and during that period of time, I had this just profound thought that, you know, I don't like the way I feel when I drink. And I think I'm gonna maybe stop you know, <laughs> they released me from the hospital. They're supposed to release you with somebody picking you up, but I, I, I was in there giving the orderlies a hard time, never getting, you know, physically violent because that was a shot in a cot. But um, they let me walk out of that place. They were like, we never do this, but you can go. And I walked out and I walked up to my friend's house, stopped by the store, I got a can of dip. And I walked over to my friend's house, and that's where my marijuana maintenance program began. Like, immediately. There's do not pass go. I never, I didn't even go home. I just walked out of there and started doing something. Well, I mean, that slowed me down enough and maybe quit drinking enough to where I could get through school and I could, I, I finished my bachelor's degree in, in athletic training. And I, you know, I did pretty well. But through that period of time, it was like I drank once a week, and then slowly but surely it did what it does, and it progressed. I, after that, I went through, I went through, uh, I got into Baylor University for grad school for uh, athletic training, a Master's of Science in Education. And I didn't know at the time, I, I 
applied to that school because it was it was the latest acceptance date and I hadn't moved early enough to get into some of these other schools that everybody else was trying to get into. So I'm like, Baylor, you know, that'll do. And I applied and, and I got in and I got in fig and got there and figured out they, this is the fourth best program of this kind in the nation. And I just thought to myself, oh, shit. You know, that means I'm going to have to do something. You know, I'm definitely going to have to start working. But I breezed through my back baccalaureate, too. So I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe I can just breeze through grad school. And that's, I'm here to tell you, that doesn't happen. Um, but the other bad thing that kind of happened then is, is I had money. You know, I was getting a stipend from the university. And they were covering my tuition, and I was getting that stipend. So I, I had cash to spend. Um, leaving my undergrad, I broke up with like a two-year girlfriend, and so I'm in this just bit of morass of self-pity, and this is, you know, I don't know how I'm going to live, and so I go drink, and this is all that I do, seven nights a week, whether it was the blackout or not, I used to go across the street to the, it was like a cinder block building, it was Scruffy Murphy's, and a cinder block building, you probably could have gotten tetanus off the bar. And, you know, I was ordering Boilermakers, man, and like one after the other after the other. And I don't know how I made it home every night. I really don't. Uh, needless to say, I, I uh, didn't do so well in school. And I got put on academic suspension. And I decided that's not what I wanted to do anymore. I want to talk about recovery. So what kept going on? was this same sort of pattern for the better part of four years, four or five years. We get to 2015, I'm, I'm homeless down in Florida. I have a job and a car, so I think I'm doing all right, you know. Uh, even if they kick me out of this abandoned house that I'm living in, I can sleep in the car. And um, my parents offered to help me. They said, hey, if you move up here, We'll help you get back on your feet. You got to quit drinking. All right, you know, absolutely. Pack all my stuff that I could in my car, and I got up here to Bisco. Immediately got plugged into a gym over there, and um, made everything look really, really good. You know, all that stuff that I learned in grad school and all the all the schooling, man. I can just sit there and rattle it off. And, you know, this isn't something that people just know, so it sounds really, really, really good, and it makes it sound like maybe I know what I'm talking about, but really, if you don't know what you're talking about, it sounds great, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, everything looks good until we get to that point to where my boss finds out about my drinking. By this point, I had gotten my second DWI, where I got slammed down in the Walmart parking lot of Bisco. It was big news around there. And uh, it's like, who's this asshole? That's that guy. That's the trainer. Um, but I, <laughs> I uh, started going to AA over in Bisco. It's a small group, you know. And I got a buddy over there now who's been my friend ever since I started coming to AA. As, you know, a lot of y'all know him, Ira. Um, there's not enough gratitude in this world to express for what I, I'm just, I'm, it was God given that Ira was put in my life, you know? And, um, cause he stayed after me. Uh, wasn't driving around much anymore, you know. I was just walking up the road, getting those two ice houses, big old tall boys. This is how I tried to manage it because liquor and wine meant I was going to black out. I could put down two fifths of wine in less than 30 minutes, man, to try to go after that feeling, you know. And, and by this point, because back in college, now I had a heck of a pot habit. So I'm smoking as much pot, just going back and forth, back and forth. Maybe get my hands on something else if I can. You know, I don't know. I don't know where it's going. I just know that it's going, and I have to keep it going. Because if it stops, it sucks. It sucks really, really bad. And I kept going to meetings, and they said get a sponsor. I got 
I looked for the meanest SOB in the room, and it was a guy named Tim Roll, and he comes in with his staff and talks about talking to animals. And but you know he he talked tough, and I was like going, okay, well if my granddad were here, he'd be, that'd be the guy he'd point me to because I, I know I'm hard headed. Um, so that's what I need. And met with him a couple times, and um, I was telling him about my problems. I it's this girlfriend that I got in Bisco, and I need money, and and I, you know if I can just get a good job. You know, and get out of my parents' house because, you know, I mean, they're just on my backs trying to get me to do things. And he looked over across the table and said, you've got to get honest. And so I got a new sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> I got a guy that's sat up in the rooms and, he, he, you know, he, he, does, he does pottery and, and <laughs> he's a good guy. He's still an AA, but uh, he said, call me when you need me. And that's what I needed. I needed somebody that was going to say, call me when you need me. Because I couldn't stop drinking, you know. I think I came over here probably picked up a white chip. I know I picked up a 90-day chip over here, maybe a 30-day too. It wasn't none of it clean, you know. Not a single one of them. It's just trying to get everybody to believe what I knew wasn't the truth. Because that's the only way I'd learn to deal with life and deal with the things in life up until that point. It was about the show. It wasn't about what was really going on with me. It was about the show that I could put on. And a lot of times I could put on a hell of a show. But it always came crashing down. And I remember kept going to meetings. I went to the, the men's spiritual retreat um, the first time. So stayed sober for three days, man. And as soon as I got back home, I went right back to that store because I didn't, nobody was around me. I knew if nobody was around me, there was nothing to do. I was going to go drink. But it was a great three days. I remember leaving down off that mountain and thinking, God, this is, I mean, I was laughing. It was keeping people up until three in the morning talking about what's a deer with no eyes. You've got no idea. Huh. You know, and, and it was just, it was retarded. And it was, it was so much fun. It was so much simple fun. And I felt great. And I was sad because it was going to end. It was definitely, I mean, it was going to end as soon as I got home and I knew that. And there wasn't anything I could do about it. Kept coming to AA. Got a job down in Robbins at the um, Holmes Building Systems. And down there, I was riding with Ira to work every day. And he's sitting there talking program, and he's happy, and I'm hungover, man. This is not a good combination at 6.30 in the morning. But I pretty quickly found all the other people in that, in that area that um, did what I wanted to do, which is most of them. And I stayed there for a while, you know, kind of kept coming to meetings when I could. You know, I didn't have time for meetings. I needed to work. I needed to do other things that I knew was going to work. And I went over to Albemarle. I picked up a six-month chip, and I remember, like, just the pit of my stomach dropped. I drank that night, and it just dropped. It fell down because I knew it wasn't honest. And I remember looking at a lady named Tina, and I said, you know, I think I'm just going to stop picking up chips. She just, why? I said, because I, I just don't see the point. I don't see the point. It's like, oh, look, you know, I've got six months. I've got two years. I mean, it's like a hierarchy. I'm, uh, you know, what are we doing here? Showing off? Yeah, okay. I don't want to do that, you know? And so that's the rationale that I used. I know in that first year until that point of surrender, until I had enough pain and went to go get treatment, the rationale and the justifications that I used were tremendous. I don't have time, you know, things aren't that bad. Um, I didn't want to lose my abs, and that's a true story. Like, I was completely vain, and I'm like, man, I might, I might lose my abs. I mean, how am I going to be a trainer with no abs? And, I mean, this is like a serious concern. <laughs> and it, but it was a, enough of an excuse to keep me from doing what I knew I was eventually going to have to do. Um, it came down to, I got a job at Jordan Lumber, 
shortly thereafter, I lost a job at Jordan Lumber because I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And I wound up with no money, no job, living at my parents' house, had my license. I, knew, I had paid my insurance, so I knew my license was going to get taken away as soon as they found out or at least as soon as they caught me. So I had to get as much out of that car as I could. Drove up to Boone, I went to the family reunion, didn't drink any of my beer because I didn't have any. And I just stayed up there and, and, and thought. I was around family and you know, talking to people all blurry-eyed, people that I grew up with and I had very fond memories of this place and for some reason it was different because I, I just, you know, I wanted to drink. and. I, uh, with all that hanging over my head, and I, I woke up one morning at 9 a.m. around and about, and I went to the beer, and I went to the beer, I went to the fridge, there you go. I went to the fridge for a beer, but that beer, in that moment, I don't know what it was about that moment, but it was just a thought that came to me, and it was clear as day, and it said, Matt, you're going to die like this. And that was it. And I didn't want to die like that. I knew I was going to finish those two beers. I didn't know anything else going on in my life, but I knew I was going to finish those two beers. And I knew that I was going to have to live my entire life as long as that was going to be. And I was going to die feeling like I felt doing what I was doing, disappointing my family, having no friends, you know, having no job prospects. No, I mean, nothing. I, 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 there was nothing in my life I could take pride in anymore. And I came here because I knew this was a place where a lot of people had recovered. And I knew that Mark Christopher came here and, and other guys that I had met through the program were here, guys who had done the work and had recovered. And I came here and I said, I need help. And as soon as I did, that started the ball rolling. And that was my moment. That was my moment of, all right, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to give it everything I got because I've got nothing to lose. Literally, I've got nothing to lose other than the ability to breathe. And I wasn't sure if I was ready to give that up. And I went down to the, I went down to the colony. I hate saying the colony. I know a lot of people hear that word a lot. But I went down to treatment. And... I walked through the doors. My aunt took me down there. My mother couldn't take me down there. And we talked talked to Mark, and he said, "Okay, well, you know, so everybody's. What, do we need to do a letter? I mean, no. Everybody's pretty aware of the problem." And at that point, I was just, I was as honest as I'd ever been. I have a drinking problem, and I can't stop. And a lot of people get in there, and they talk about how I couldn't sleep for two weeks, and that was just not my case. I slept like a rock the entire time I was in there because deep down inside of me it was over. I had my choice back and I didn't ne I never had to go back to that if I didn't want to. These people were going to help me. I trusted them because I couldn't trust myself. And I went through the program and I did the best I could. I did everything that I got and they helped peel back my excuses and my BS and just take everything away. So my problem became me. And once my problem was me, now, now maybe something can be done about it. You know, maybe I'm not this great guy that I think that I am. I'm not just such a gift to be able to talk to and be around. I hadn't paid attention to any of the evidence in my life. You know, but at this moment I could see. And I did what they told me to do, and I, and I came up here to the recovery homes, and, you know, I've, uh, I've stayed there, and getting, getting out of treatment really is kind of when recovery started for me. Because in there, they gave me a toolbox. They, they taught me things. They, they showed me things about myself. Then they plopped me out and they said, okay, what are you going to do about it? And so I got in here. I did, I did the only thing I knew how to do at the, moment, at the time is I came here and I came to meetings. And I listened to people 
you know, and I said some things while in those early days. I can't even remember what I said, but I don't know if it was correct or not, but I did everything that I could because I'm like, man, if you don't know what's going on, you can't help me. And so I talked, and I talked, and I hung around people in the program. And, I mean, desperate as a dying man because I knew that's what was going to happen. I got a job down there at the, at the Double Eagle restaurant. Um, if you want to get a job at a bar right after you get out of treatment, that's up to you. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but man, it, it was a blessing to have the boss that I had there. Uh, he was a he was a Marine, um, loved the Marine Corps, and had no problem telling me the truth, which is exactly what I needed. Because I got out of there, and I got out of treatment, and I still had ideas. I still had ideas about how I'm going to stay sober and what I'm going to do with my life and everything in between. Like, I knew it. I knew it all again. Suddenly, man, 28 days through treatment, and here I am. Matt, you're welcome. <laughs> And this guy, man, he just, he, between coming to these rooms and going there, and I was open about it, I, you know, I'm 30 days sober, and uh, I don't want to drink alcohol anymore. He's like, oh, is that right? Yeah, I know, I don't. Okay. All right, man, well, I'll support you in any way I can. But if you drink, you're fired. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, that was good incentive. But through that process, and as I'm sitting here telling him how to run his restaurant or what he needs to do with me or that I need more hours and all this kind of stuff, and, and having a bad attitude the entire time, he was very honest with me and um, would cuss me up and down and, and, and tell me what I needed to hear. I, he was running the line and I told me to drop something. I didn't drop it because, well, it'd be better if I dropped it in a couple of minutes. And he just got over in my ear and he said, you know, when I effing tell you to do something, you know what you effing say? I said, I mean, just anger. That's all I felt was anger all up inside of me. I said, yes, sir. He said, that's right. Oh. Jeez. I tell you, I look back on that moment. And I'm grateful for that moment because that started to re-break me to allow me to be willing and to make me realize it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. He's the boss and I'm not. And that's real. You know, he pays my paycheck. I need that paycheck to pay my bills. And that's real. And... That relationship grew, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great relationship today. I still, I still talk to the guy. Um, but somewhere in the midst of all that, I, you know, I started to, you know, I'd come in, and I'd be exhausted, and I, I wouldn't like my job, and I'd find a problem with every single thing. Uh, I, I've, I've got to walk to meetings. I've, you know, I don't have enough money. I, I'm going right back into the same cycle that I've always had, and I don't know. I kept praying, and on the hardest days, I'd go into that back alley, and I'd hit my knees, and I'd pray in the gravel. God, just give me the strength to get me through this moment, this day. Keep me sober, please. And I'd get to a meeting, and I'd go home and be around other recovering guys. And somewhere amongst all that, and reading the literature and working the steps with the sponsor, my attitude started to be different. I started to realize that I don't have control over anything that happens in my life. The only thing that I could possibly affect is how I think and feel about it. My attitude was what made me feel better. You know, changing my attitude about it. I can't change the situation, but maybe I can change my attitude. And that kind of started to happen. And, I just remember the whole time through this process, not remembering what I'm thinking, not knowing what I'm feeling, just keep going. Just stand up and just keep going. Whatever happens, don't drink. Don't drink. Call somebody. Don't drink. And that pretty much sums up the early days of my sobriety because I, I didn't know anything else. I just kept doing what they told me to do. And through that process, I've 
you know, hours started getting short there uh, around Christmas, and, and I decided to apply for some other jobs. And one of them was the front desk at, at First Health uh, Fitness Center, which is, you know, what my schooling is in, and, and it's really what I love to do. Uh, I'm 31, and I've been lifting weights for 18 years now. You know, it's a long time to be doing something. And it's what I want to do, you know. It's where I can most help other people who maybe want to do what I'm doing, you know. I can't tell you how to put together a car, but, man, if you want to pick up 200 pounds, we can work on it, you know. And that started a whole process. And even to this day, as I go through my day, things don't happen the way that I want them to happen. I should already be a manager at First Health, and I should already be calling some shots, and that is just not the way it works, Matt. It's not the way it works. And I've got to pray. I've got to get on my knees, and I've got to pray because, God, I, that humility thing, man, I've got to work on being humble. I've got to stay humble before God, before y'all, before my friends, because my ego is a killer. My ego is enough to put me six feet under, and, and that's a fact. You know, and my sponsor always says, he says, you know, trust God, clean house, help others. Trust God, clean house, help others. There's been some times recently where I was getting worked up about them working me too much. Oh, God, now they're working me too much, you know. And, you know, I remember Mark sitting over there and saying, you know, when I'm in service, I don't have any of those feelings. And he was right. Because when I'm thinking about what I can do for somebody else, I don't really come into the equation, and that's the best possible situation there could possibly be, is that I don't get into it too much. I just do what's in front of me, I do what I'm told, I look at reality, you know, I still have anger that crops up, but I pray about it. And there's an inventory process on it that I can now do at the end of every day and figure out what it was that was really bothering me. And the answer is always me. The answer is always, why did I get angry? I got angry because I gave somebody power to make me angry and I made all the excuses to do it. And that's today, I, man, I, I never had that aha blinding light moment. I just got in and I trusted some other people and I did the only thing I knew how to do which has gotten better over the past 14 months it hasn't you know but it's 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 gotten better and, it, and it's just work at it just work at it and keep going some days there wasn't anything else I could do other than just show up just show up where you feet at all these kinds of stuff the, the sayings on the wall up there Except for think, think, think. Barry told me I couldn't do that one. <laughs> but first things first. You know? Richard, I've got this going on, this going on, and this going on, and I don't know whether to pay the bill or, or, or should I run over here and help the... Matt, whoa. First things first, man. What's most important? I should probably pay rent because I don't want to get kicked out. <laughs> there you go. And sometimes that's all it takes, you know, to get me thinking... Okay, start thinking linearly and, and, and how to solve it. You know, as long as any problem that I face today, I put AA in it, I put God in it, and I stay sober, it works out. It doesn't matter if it's in my favor or not, I'm okay with whatever result happens. And I'm okay with sitting up here and talking to you and letting you know who I am. And I'm okay with talking about who I am. Because it's who I am. It's the way God made me. I can't be any different. You know? But He doesn't, he doesn't do these things to us to punish us. He, he makes us the way we are to see what we're going to do with it. Because we all have, you know, He gave me gifts that I can use. He gave me gifts that I can use, and if I get if I step out of the way, it just seems to work out, and that seems to happen. So, 
I'm sober because of AA, and I'm sober because of the people in this room, and uh, thanks for letting me share tonight.